Okay, so now that we've diagnosed IPF, let me tell you a little bit more about the disease, and this is the last few slides. IPF can have many names. The one we, the accepted universally uh, used name is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. UIP or usual interstitial pneumonitis is a description of the pathologic findings. Um, the British call it cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. Uh, other names include diffuse interstitial fibrosis, honeycomb lung, idiopathic interstitial fibrosis, et cetera. Differential diagnosis, um, there are, of course, the, the the first thing you're going to think of is other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, uh, and these are them. Connective tissue disorders, asbestosis, that produces UIP. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, there was a study, I think, by National Jewish uh, a number of years ago that estimated that about 10% of the patients who uh, come to lung transplant at their facility are thought to actually have chronic HP instead of uh, IPF. Sarcoidosis, chronic drug toxicity, I have a couple patients that have taken macrodantin uh, for many years and uh, have uh, some chronic toxicity issues. Other diseases including COPD, heart failure, and lymphangitic uh, spread of carcinoma. Again, IPF is the most common of the idiopathic interstitial uh, pneumonias. Um, it's associated with the pathologic pattern of UIP, which I'll show you some uh, slides of in a minute. Poor prognosis, the average survival is three years from the time of diagnosis. Worldwide, it's estimated that five million people suffer from IPF. The prevalence in the United States uh, was estimated by actually a very good trial, a very good epidemiologic study done by uh, uh, Ganesh Raghu, to be about 14 to 42 per 100,000 population, depending on the criteria you use. So if you take, when I made this slide, I used the, the Census Bureau estimate of 306 million people in the U.S. So the prevalence uh, estimate in the U.S. using that number is between 43 and 130,000. Uh, it's of course thought to be underdiagnosed. Uh, the prevalence of course increases with age. IPF, uh, while it's not strictly a disease caused by smoking like emphysema and COPD, IPF is associated with cigarette smoking with an odds ratio of 2.3 for smokers. It preferentially affects men with this male to female ratio, 2.5 to 1.6. Usually occurs in the fifth, between the fifth and seventh decade with 66% of patients uh, older than 60 at the time of diagnosis. The mean age of diagnosis is 66 years. Familial IPF, and, and Dr. Lloyd will tell you that this is an underestimate, but it usually accounts for about 0.5 to 2% of cases. Um, and that's defined by two or more verified cases within a primary family unit. That includes parents, siblings, or children. The clinical features of familial IPF are identical except for an earlier age of onset. And in a large study of 111 families, this showed autosomal pattern of inheritance, and I think it has a variable penetrance. The course is variable. Some patients have a slowly progressive course, while others experience exacerbations that lead to large declines in lung function, like the patient I showed you earlier and this leads to respiratory failure and sometimes death. Uh, this is a slide I also uh, got from Dr. Noth um, from a, uh, a paper um, in 2003 in the Red Journal. And this shows basically the, the stepwise theory and stepwise progression of IPF. It's not thought that IPF slow, sort of slowly progresses along a, uh, a straight line, but rather that there are, are multiple hits along the way of the natural history. Uh, that cause uh, progressive uh, declines uh, in the patient's uh, respiratory function and uh, worsening of symptoms. Some of these can be so severe that, that they produce precipitous drops and can cause respiratory failure and even lead to death. Usually the pathology of that, by the way, is diffuse alveolar damage uh, superimposed upon the UIP. So. Uh, as, as the name idiopathic implies, we, we don't know what causes IPF, but there are some hypotheses for the pathogenesis of IPF, um, including uh, inf inflammation causing fibrosis, acute and chronic cellular inflammation, uh, non-inflammatory or multiple hit hypothesis uh, with, multiple, with epithelial injury and abnormal wound healing in the absence of chronic inflammation. There's also a vascular remodeling hypothesis uh, that states that ab aberrant vascular remodeling supports fibrosis and can contribute to increased shunt and hypoxemia. So the bottom line is we really don't have any idea what causes IPF, uh, but there are some good theories out there. Uh, 
just briefly at the end here, uh, histopathology of IPF. We talked about UIP and I've been using that word quite a bit. Um, it stands for usual interstitial uh, pneumonia or usual interstitial pneumonitis and that's the histologic lesion that's essential for the diagnosis of IPF. The, the cardinal features of that are temporal heterogeneity, meaning that there are areas of, of very advanced dense fibrosis intermixed with areas of relatively normal lung. It does have a predilection for peripheral uh, and basilar locations, as we mentioned earlier, with radiographic changes. There are these interesting uh, little uh, uh, histologic features called fibroblastic foci uh, that are uh, aggregates of proliferating fibroblasts and myofibroblasts and relatively young connective tissue, and that's been a focus of a lot of research. It's thought that these are seen at the leading edge of fibrosis, and it's thought that if we can unravel what's going on in these fibroblastic foci, Perhaps that will tell us a lot about the pathogenesis of the disease and allow us to help um, uh, prevent the progression. Microscopic honeycomb cysts, as, you, as we see even in, in, on high-res CT, you can see those microscopically as well. Uh, this is uh, some surgical sections that demonstrate the UIP pathology. Here you can see uh, peripheral accentuation of the disease and you can see some honeycomb cysts here. There's a transition into uninvolved lung. This is relatively uninvolved, normal, thin appearing alveoli. There's not a lot of inflammation seen in these cases, and this is areas of dense fibrosis. The things I've circled here, you can't really see it too well, but these are sort of uh, hypopigmented. These are the fibroblastic foci, and you can kind of see a little lump here. And this is right at the leading edge of the fibrosis. Um, and this is a high power image of that fibroblastic foci. So. Uh, um, those are very interesting little, um, little uh, cells or collection of cells. Um, this is a larger section that actually uh, shows some of the honeycomb changes. And as you go more medially away from the pleural surface, you start seeing more normal lung. There's some artifact here um, from the sectioning, of course. But um, here you see relatively normal appearing lung, and you see fibrosis right next to it. And that's the heterogeneity we mentioned earlier. Briefly, acute exacerbations, um, they're characterized by acute, unexpected deterioration in the clinical status, sudden worsening of symptoms, hypoxemia, and a new ground glass infiltrates. If this is in the differential diagnosis, you have to exclude CHF and infection. The yearly incidence is thought to be about 10 to 15 percent. The pathology, as I mentioned earlier, is UIP with superimposed DAD or organizing pneumonia. The prognosis of these acute exacerbations is poor. The mortality can be as high as 96 uh, percent. Um, it's treated generally with corticosteroids, but there's no proven benefit to doing that. Uh, and again, this is just another slide to show you uh, the stepwise progression and some of the severe acute exacerbations that can occur. Um, and with that, I think I'm done.